Hello and welcome back. Today I want to start talking about balans. But before doing that, we need to look at some signal transmission related topics. How can you take a signal from point A to point B? And what are some of the things to keep in mind when choosing a method? There are a lot of concepts behind this, starting with the way in which the signal is generated, the transmission interface and the exact interconnection between the various bits. So there's quite a bit to cover. But if you're curious, then keep watching. So first things first, how hard can it be to send a signal from point A to point B? Well, first up, we have the concepts of single-ended and differential signaling. In its simplest form, to be able to send a signal over conductors, you will need, well, a signal source, a load, and these need to be interconnected using two wires. Now, this circuit cannot exist in an ideal world isolated from everything else. To some extent, it will have a link to a ground. This brings us to the first important term related to signal transmission, which is single-ended signaling. With this method, one of the wires is the signal line, whereas the other is the reference, the ground. This is the most simple form of interconnection and it has certain advantages and well disadvantages. If you need to transmit say 10 signals, you will only need 11 wires, since all of the signals have the common ground. So this method is widely used when multiple signals need to be sent over relatively short distances. But one of the disadvantages here is that the common ground is not a perfect conductor. It has non-zero impedance. So because of this common path, you will have some degree of crosstalk and signal integrity problems. The other more complicated, but to some extent better way is differential signaling. Here, the signal source consists of two mirrored signals, one inverted in reference to the other, and these are sent over two lines to the receiver, which subtracts them to form the final output signal. In essence, creating a difference. Now, for this to work, you will need three lines, two for the actual signal and one for the common ground. So the first obvious problem with this method is that you need far more lines. With 10 signal sources, you will need 21 lines. So two for each signal plus the common ground. You also have far more complex transmission and reception circuitry. So this inverting bit and the differential amplifier are extra bits not found in the single-ended circuits. So why do this? Well, there are a few advantages. First, the signal that reaches the load can be double that of the initial amplitude. Or in other words, you can lose half of the signal on the way and still be left with the initial thing. Another key advantage of the differential input is that any common noise found on both input signal lines will get subtracted from each other, resulting in some degree of noise immunity. So you will need to make some special measures to actually get the same amount of noise on both lines. But even when the injected noise is of slightly different amplitudes, as long as it's in phase, the end result will be less noise than in the case of an equivalent noise injection into a single-ended transmission line. So usually differential signaling is used when large distances and better noise immunity are needed. The next important set of terms to discuss is balanced and unbalanced interfaces, which is something related to the transmission interface impedance rather than the signal transmission method. So balancing refers to impedance balance in the signal transmission elements. If we come back to our initial example, where we had the signal source, set of wires and a load, the system can be considered balanced only where all of the impedances are equal. And by that I mean the two outputs of the signal source, the two inputs of the wires, the two outputs of the wires, and the two connections of the load, with all of these impedances having the reference in the almighty ground. Now, it's important to point out that to keep the system balanced, the interconnected impedances do not have to be equal. So that's something else. So for example, Z1 does not have to be equal to Z3. Only the other impedances need to be equal. So one obvious unbalanced system is the basic single-ended circuit. Here, one line has the signal source with some 
internal impedance, the line can have another impedance, and while the load again some other value of impedance, and the other line, the ground, has zero impedance. So whatever these other impedances are, we will always have a unbalanced system. An obvious balanced system can be the differential interface. So if we have the two opposing signal sources with the same output impedance, connected to a differential line that has the same characteristic impedance on both lines, and while on the receiving side we have equal impedances on the differential amplifier's input, then we have a balanced system. Now, it's important to point out that a single-ended system does not have to be unbalanced, and the differential system does not necessarily have to be balanced. So one interesting example I found takes a single-ended output through a defined output impedance through one line of a balanced line pair, and the other line is connected to ground again through the same impedance, and at the other end we find a differential amplifier with balanced inputs. Now, since the two transmitted signals are the same, so they're not inverted, one in reference to the other, they just have different amplitudes, we can say that this is a single-ended system. But from an impedance balance point of view, the initial conditions can be met. So we can't have all of the impedances the same, so we can create a balanced system like this. In a similar fashion, we can create a differential system that is unbalanced. So if all of the impedances are different, the inverting output has a different impedance compared to the non-inverting one, the two transmission lines have different impedances and the receiver again has different loads, or well, just one of these elements is enough to make the system unbalanced, then even though it's differential, it's still unbalanced. Now, an important thing to discuss is why even bother with this balancing? What's the point? Well, this has to do with noise immunity and noise emission. If we have a balanced interface, which is exposed to an external noise, you can make the assumption that the line's impedance to the noise source will also be the same. In other words, the same amount of interference will be injected into both lines. But when you have a differential receiver, the two equal noise signals will be subtracted one from the other and cancel out, so the useful signal will be highly immune to any sort of external interference. In a similar fashion, if the transmitted signal is differential and the lines have the same impedance, the noise created by each line will be the same but of opposing sign, so the ambient will not see anything since the two noises cancel each other out. Once there's a difference in the two impedances, this cancelling out effect will not occur and you will get immunity problems and, well, emission problems. Well, since we're on the topic of impedance and transmission lines, Another thing to talk about is impedance matching. This refers to the interconnection points between the different elements and whether the impedances are the same or not in these points. Even though this can be applied to any of the things previously discussed, for the sake of simplicity, let's look at a single-ended unbalanced system. Here we have four impedances. The signal source, the transmission line's two ends, and the load. We can say that the system is impedance matched when the source is matched to the connecting line and the line is matched to the connected load. So a basic example here is a 50 ohm signal source like an antenna connected to a 50 ohm transmission line like a piece of coax cable and received by a device with a 50 ohm input. On both sides of the interface we have the same impedance 50 ohms so the system is impedance matched. Now, this is not always easy to achieve, especially with complex signal sources and loads. So it's important to observe why this is important. Without going into too many details, if the two interconnected impedances are the same, all of the incident signal arrives at the load. If there are differences, part of the signal will get reflected. The exact amount can be evaluated using the reflection coefficient. In practice, the impedance mismatch will affect both RF, single frequency signals, as well as digital square waves. In RF systems, impedance matching is important to deliver the maximum amount of power possible. If the impedances are not matched, then you will not get this maximum power, which is half of the output power of your amplifier. In digital systems, impedance matching is important to preserve signal integrity. 
a mismatched impedance, will deliver a signal with reflections and other artifacts to the load. And in extreme cases, the load will not be able to clearly see the transmitted data, so the communication will get corrupted. Now, it's important to point out that you don't always want to perform impedance matching between your signal source and your load. So although impedance matching is the best thing when you want to transfer the maximum possible amount of power, or when you want to prevent reflections, it's a method that only delivers 50% of the output power. In other words, it's quite inefficient. So for best efficiency, you want your source impedance to be far smaller than the load impedance, or in other words, to have a large load to source impedance ratio. So when reflections are not a concern, or when efficiency and power dissipation is of the highest importance, you will not be matching impedances. But how can you transfer the maximum amount of power when you're 50% efficient? Does that even make sense? So to keep the math simple, let's analyze a DC circuit with resistors and try out some values. So if we take a 1 volt ideal source with a 1 volt source impedance and we see what happens with three different values of load resistance, so 0.1, 1 ohm and 10 ohms, we can calculate the efficiency. So as expected, our maximum efficiency does occur for the 10 ohm load, the largest one, where we get about 91%. But if we calculate the delivered power, whether we have the 10 ohm load or the 0.1 ohm load, we get the same roughly 70 milliwatts of power delivery. But with the 1 ohm load, we get the peak at 200 milliwatts. So even though this isn't the most efficient method of transferring power, this will yield the highest amount of power that you can actually get. So you can work out the mathematics by derivating this equation and you will see that your maximum power delivery to load does occur when the load to source ratio is 1. Finally, when you need to extract the highest amount of power from a source, like an antenna, or when long cables are involved, you will be matching impedances. But when designing things like power amplifiers, where efficiency is of the utmost importance, you will be using low output impedances, which are not directly matched to the output loads. One problem that you might run into in the real world is that half of your circuit is of one type and the other half is of the other type. You might need to interconnect an unbalanced circuit to a balanced one or a single ended circuit to a differential one or some other combination. And this brings us to the final topic of today, interconnecting circuitry and balance. Depending on the use case and operating frequency, you will find that different implementations are better suited. Some basic examples of electronic circuit implementations are logic gate based or op amp based on the transmission side, so for converting the single ended signal to a differential one, and then on the receiving side, we have differential amplifiers either linear implementations with op amps or just Trigger-Schmidt comparators. These are unidirectional circuits that are common in digital signal interfaces or in audio or certain higher frequency analog signals. These can be made to have balanced outputs and inputs, so then you can to some extent call them balance, but that's not mandatory. Anyway, in the relatively low RF frequency range, but sometimes also in audio applications, we have transformer based circuits. Here we have the voltage and the current balun. So these will interface unbalanced to balanced systems. And while there's various derivations depending on the impedances that are being interconnected, and both of these are bidirectional. So you can swap the signal source and the load. And at the higher frequency end, we have the transmission line balun, usually used in very high frequency applications. And one such example is the quarter wavelength and three quarter wavelengths Balen, which is a one to one impedance matching circuit. Now, there's also an intermediate thing called a transmission line transformer, which is a wideband Balen that takes advantage of both of these mechanisms the magnetic coupling of the transformer and the transmission line properties of, well, the transmission line, but that's a topic for a different time. Anyway, the exact method that you will choose will be highly impacted by the frequency of operation, the power levels that you're working with, and the exact signal type in question. Finally, let's look at some examples. Where can we find some of these topics 
in real life applications. For the digital world, a good place to look at is a computer and related components. Here we can see some clear examples. Single-ended signals can be found on your video RAM interface or the main CPU RAM interface. Usually when the signals do not run in pairs, they are single-ended. If we do look for trace pairs, we will find some differential signals like the PCI Express bus, the DVI video connector and others. And for the sake of reducing interference, both the single-ended as well as the differential interfaces can be implemented as impedance matched to some extent at least. And for the differential traces, these are also usually balanced. In the RF world, most pieces of equipment, measurement or radios have single-ended unbalanced inputs and outputs, but certain loads like dipole based antennas are balanced. So here usually there is a balan needed to interface the two. Again, in general, all interfaces are impedance matched. Finally, it's worth mentioning some cables. You will find single-ended communication through ribbon cables, like the old IDE interface, and a good example of differential cables can be found in Ethernet transmission, where you have the shielded twisted pair STP and the unshielded UTP versions. Hopefully, this was not too boring. But it was important to highlight just how complex the topic of sending signals can be. The exact choice of components and connections will be highly impacted by the use case at hand. Do you want something cheap? Do you want immunity to noise? Do you just want to somehow use a component you are forced to include into your design? There are many considerations. Next time I will start looking into the various topics in more detail. But for now, Hope you got some useful information after this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be updated on my videos. And see you next time. Bye bye.